Hi, I'm Mark Stoudemire, and welcome to Season 3 of Get to the Joke. I can't wait for you guys to see what I have in store for you this season. 11 new comics, 11 new stories, unbelievable amount of just advice and just vulnerability about the lives of comedians and how that translates to the jokes that you love to hear on stage. Again, all the content this season will be completely free on my YouTube channel. I just ask that you do me just one small favor. Please like and subscribe to my channel. Please rate and review me wherever you review your podcast. I truly appreciate that you guys do that for me. Uh, again, you can also visit me at my website, markstod.com, where you can see all my upcoming show dates, all of any other content that I put out. Um, again, please leave a comment, like, subscribe to this channel. It means so much to me that you do that. And uh, now without further ado, let's go ahead and get to the joke. What comes after? Winter. I love winter. Some people don't. I had a great winter last winter, talk and build it. I done something last winter I ain't never done. I sold Christmas trees. And it's a great thing to do to sell Christmas trees. A lot of you people probably do it because everybody come in by a Christmas trees all happy and gay and full of frivolity, you know, because it's Christmas time except for some flatlanders come in there a little tight, you know, like <laughs> Christmas Eve, 8 o'clock, we was closing up shop. And this flatlander come running in with his big sub car. Of course, I'd had a bad day anyway. I'd found a Band-Aid in my donut. This flatlander come running in big sub car, jams on his brakes, gets out of his rig, picks up a tree. He says, hi, how long has this tree been cut? I said, well, now I'm six foot four, and I'm looking straight across top of that tree. My eyes is about four inches down from top of my head. I think that tree's been cut about six foot long. <laughs> he said, no, no. How long has this tree been cut? I said, now, of course, I'm taller in the morning. I got these boots. I got these boots. I fell for nothing at the dump. Put me up another inch or two. I'm up to six, five, six, six. I think that tree's been cut about six foot one, six foot two inches long. He says, no, you don't understand. How long has this tree been cut? I said, no, I understand. I stretch out even feather when I'm laying down. I might be six, 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 seven. I think that tree's been cut about six foot two, six foot three inches long. He says, you idiot, I'm in a hurry. I've got to get out of here. You're holding me up. Here's 20 bucks. I got to go. And with that, he handed me the $20 bill, went through the tree into the back of his rig. But before he got into his rig to drive off, he took a look at me and he said, you know what, pal? You got to be the stupidest idiot I've ever met. And I looked at him with his $20 bill. I said, well, I may be the stupidest idiot you've ever met, but I just got $20 off of you for a $5 tree that's been sitting here since Thanksgiving. <laughs> All right. All right. Um, so first of all, this is this is surreal. This is a very surreal moment. I am nervous and excited and um, uh, very uh, hoping to take everything in the moment with our guest today, Mr. Rusty Dewees, who is an actor, musician, comedian and writer from Stowe, Vermont. Rusty is known for his work on such acclaimed movies like Black Dog, starring alongside the late Meatloaf, and on television shows such as Law and Order. He, however, is most famous for his character, The Logger, which has produced three specials and has sold out theaters throughout New England for nearly two decades. He produces, writes, directs, provides voice talent off the musical accompaniment for radio and television spots throughout New England. And you can catch him on RustyDeWeese.com, TheLogger.com, and on Instagram at rusty.dewees. 
Mr. Deweese, welcome to Get to the Joke. Thank you so much for being here today. Thanks, man. Yeah, just call me Rusty. Okay, Rusty. <laughs> this is awesome. This is awesome. So a little bit to pull back the curtain a little bit. Uh, for those who don't know me that well, every year, the first week of the year, I will watch The Logger. I start every year out by watching The Logger, Volume 1. It's one of the best specials I've ever seen. And, and, and I, I watch it because it's tradition and because it inspires me to like set my goals for comedy for that year. I just like it. It's it's a unique uh, special as far as not being not only just being hilarious, but it's there's no other comedy special like this that exists out there, which is why you have ranked so high in my book. So I, I definitely want to talk about the logger. that's going to be our tree trunk today. And then we're going to find some roots in there to kind of go back a little bit. Um, I also have the logger two, which I watch from time to time. And I don't have the logger three, but it's free on YouTube. So <laughs> okay, I, but I can get I can get you it because there's oh. something. There's, there's part of it. Part of it isn't on YouTube. There's a documentary. Oh. But anyway, go ahead. Yes, yes, I like that about the, the documentary part. But first of all, how are you doing, Rusty? How are things up there in Vermont right now? And how are things personally with you for with you know two years as an entertainer during a pandemic? How are you doing? Well, thanks for asking. Um, I'm good. Uh, pa pandemic wise, not to marginalize anything because it's yeah. a serious, serious thing. Um, real serious. Yeah. I didn't, I live alone. I'm an introvert. I have friends. I, I go out. Mm -hmm. So it didn't, it didn't adjust my life. Mm -hmm. It adjusted my job which you, I think you yeah. might be getting at. So yeah, yeah, basically for the past two years have not been able to do indoor shows. And that's, that's a big, big thing. Cause I get hired by schools. I get hired yeah. by companies to do company parties. Mm -hmm. And then I produce my own theater shows and then I get hired by theaters. Yeah. So there wasn't that, but last summer I bought a Mack truck and I went yes. literally, and I got my CDL and I went outside, did outside shows. And I'm just this Saturday, I'm starting to do my first indoor tour. Ooh. in two years so uh, yeah. i have about 10 shows this winter so but as far as uh, personally yeah. i'm really i'm fine i'm I oh, that's good everything, yeah. that's good that's awesome to hear because you know it's i think maybe besides bernie sanders you might be the biggest celebrity in vermont um oh. and so and, you know i'm funny i was um because i liked you on facebook i and it, and and i and i watch your page i like i saw like people like tag your celebrity and see they write back to you and you wrote back yeah. to somebody like am i a celebrity like of course you're a celebrity like dude you're you're super famous and you're hilarious and i want to get to how you did all this because you didn't start out as a comic um you um you started out uh first of all you were doing you know mostly high school plays and then after high school you did like serious plays and eventually you did dramatic acting in New York City. Um, the first assemblance of this logger character coming together was when you were asked to play Armand Jeleno in uh, a Vermont play. And you said that was the birth of the logger just because of the way he talked. What about that character and the logger um, is different than other characters that existed in acting at that time? Because it seems like you created a character out of nothing that there was no precedent to the logger um besides me this jello character you talked about roots there are a couple of roots yeah. that lead to, to, to that so i was in a play called judavine it was a, like mm -hmm. a vermonter's our town play i played mm -hmm. several characters and man who wrote it was uh, david budbill i was 26 at the time he was about 44 mm -hmm. he was a poet and he wrote this one character who you're talking about who was a logger armand mm -hmm. He was pretty funny, but it was a serious play too. Yeah, I like serious plays more. I did that play, but what I learned, so the basically in a nutshell, and I'm I'm not going in depth with all these answers because I know yeah. you have a big program. Yeah. Um, um, in a nutshell, I learned timing in that comedy timing, but what I really learned was that people, Vermonters, because it was done mm -hmm. in Vermont, it was a Vermont play, liked mm -hmm. to come and see realness, and the character was real, so he spoke real, he cussed. Not that, not that, you, that that's, that, that's a qualifier for being real. <laughs> so, so I played this log guy. He was a logger. Yeah. I had eight to 10 years before that done concrete work, yeah. logging work and work with real working class Vermonters. Mm -hmm. For some reason, all of those folks, what they said went into my ear, their tone, their sensibilities. I was attracted to the working class Vermonter as opposed, let's say, to being very attracted to surgeons, 
yeah. <laughs> or, or tech people, you know? Yeah. So, so I was attracted to that. So now you have the, the natural attraction I had to it, mm -hmm. the, the being in that one play. And then uh, when I, I just had time, I was living in New York city and I yeah. just started I, from David Budbill's play. Mm -hmm. I realized also that David Budbill is just some guy yeah. who wrote words down about his experience. Mm -hmm. I learned that from Judah Vine. So yeah. the timing, the acting, the people coming to it, the mm -hmm. character, and that all you have to do is write stuff down. So I wrote my own stuff down, and the character came out as a logger. Yeah. Now, this, this appeal of appealing to working class people, um, was that because your, back, your parents were working class? Your father was a bus driver. I'm not exactly sure what your mother did, but did you feel that your family and people like you were underrepresented? in like theater and other like television and movies. And you thought that here was kind of your competitive advantage to kind of, you know, make a, make a name for yourself. Oh, geez. I got three answers there. Um, <laughs> yes. I was attracted to that probably because of, because mm -hmm. my folks are working class people and their folks are working class people. Mm -hmm. um, I it never, when I wrote those stories, it was never about representing anything. It was okay. just about, it was just about, that's what came out when I thought of something. Mm -hmm. um i wasn't like saying i want people to know who these people are i wasn't saying that i was just <laughs> and then the other thing was yeah uh the, the, the good good you had a really nice point there the marketing mm -hmm. of it when i when i was doing jew divine it was a huge it was a really well done play the people yep. were good the director was good the writing it was hugely uh attended so at that age i was 26 27 i'd done plays a lot of my life and and I thought, boy, once I, I recognized that people like that in Judavine, and then they liked my stuff, my stuff mm -hmm. had value to them too. I was like, oh, I'm not going to just stop now doing the logger yeah. and write another play about uh, UPS or, or, <laughs> or a chef. Yeah. I'm going to keep doing this because mostly because I'm attracted to it, mm -hmm. but also because I can what I can do with this is apparently – saleable yeah that's awesome so you then go to new york city where you pers pursue acting like seriously i know you're working at an auctioneer house and you're still going back to vermont on the weekends to do you know manual labor but you're in new york city that that's for you know for the weekdays that's expensive that's time you know time commitment everything like that what did your parents say because you didn't come from an entertainment family you didn't come from an entertainment town like los angeles what would your what did your parents have to say when the snowball effects happening. Okay, well, it's high school plays. Now it's community theater plays. Now you're in New York. You're actually a SAG actor. What was their perception? Were they supportive? Were they like cringing about this acting thing? What were their thoughts around you as an actor at the early stages? Yeah, I can answer that and give a short illustration. In a nutshell, I can say I was very much blessed mm -hmm. with parents who, I don't know, I, they weren't judgmental or, or pushy they didn't it's the cliche that they didn't care what the kid mm -hmm. me did and, and i know other people have a different experience so here's the way i illustrate that mm -hmm. when i was when i got out of college i went to champlain college to play basketball yeah uh, i was four, out of high school four years so when i got out of college i was like 22 years old and i was going to stay in burlington and do the plays that you were just talking mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. and i did and during the day I worked in an, I worked at a gas station. So here's how I can tell you that my parents were not uh, negative about me trying to be an actor. They would, they lived in Stowe. So it was 35 mm -hmm. miles away from Burlington. Mm -hmm. They would just kind of, they, they were both retired. They would just drive into Burlington to get like some food at friendlies or something. Yeah. Not all the time. They weren't weird parents, <laughs> yeah. but they would just drive by to see me. Yeah. Pumping gas. Awesome. They were, Happy to see me mm -hmm. pumping gas because I actually liked pumping gas. I happened to yeah. be pumping gas for a guy that was kind of a local guy. He owned mm -hmm. the gas station. They mm -hmm. kind of knew him too. So they thought, hey, Rusty, Rusty's, Rusty's pumping gas for Randy mm -hmm. Bourne. You know, that's when people actually pumped, pumped the yeah. gas. In there. Yeah. So that's, that's, that's who I had for parents. Nice. I could have done anything. And, and so, same with my sister. I used to say to people, you know, if I, if I, uh, I shouldn't even say this, but, yeah. you know, if I, if I got caught, um, you know, uh, assassinating a, a, dig, a, a dignitary, my mom would go, well, you know, you know, the president really wasn't good at, uh, <laughs> so, so no, they were, awesome. they were just, they were just happy. I was 29. That's a good point. Yeah. Good question. Yeah. Cause I was 29. 
mm-hmm. too. It wasn't like I was 18. I want to be an actor. And the parents go, yeah. okay, try it for four years. I was 29 yeah. years. I went pumping gas. Now he's going to try to be an actor. Mm-hmm. And that auction house thing you mentioned, that was a big, 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 big deal too. That was a steady, yeah. solid job yeah. that I got because of the working class thing. Yeah. I was yeah. going to go to New York and get some you know, side job that I could go to auditions mm-hmm. and then come to this. No, I had a real job. And then after six years of that job, I started to go to auditions. So anyway, yeah. Uh, good point about mm-hmm. anything. Some people don't have this and it can work both ways. If you don't have the family mm-hmm. uh, support that can help you <laughs> yeah, yeah. in the arts. Mm-hmm. But I, if I had to choose, I would take the someone who supported me. So I have a two part question now with your parents, which is, they go when the logger started to become a thing and you started to work out the material and tour and eventually when you were filming it for your for your special did they come to all your performances and the follow-up question is why did you not interview your parents at the end of the first logger was there a a, a reason for that or not include them in some capacity in the logger one or logger two okay. Remember your question because I'll have to. I'm, okay, my I mind the, goes ahead. The first, the first that's right. That's all, I, I'm sorry. I, 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 I'm very um, nervous and excited. I'm sorry. No, the, no, 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 no. It's it's my mind. I I answer the questions right away and then yeah. I have to go back. Uh, first of all, if you get the, uh, I give you the third DVD. Yeah. I think it's the third DVD. Or is it the second one? Which one has the calendar making of the, the calendar? The first one. That's the first. Okay, one. so you see my parents in that. Oh, they're in the calendar part. They drive okay. by. They drive by in a car. Okay. But so, so I wasn't, you know, I was, a, I was trying to do a real thing. This was a real yeah. business. So yeah. it's not like Bill Gates is going to say, hey, mom, dad, come on down and, and do the, you know, you know work, work for me. Some families yeah. do. So it was a real business. They weren't acting yeah. people. I did interview them because they were, they were not, nor am I, yeah. native Vermonters. The yeah. people I interviewed on, on the first mm-hmm. logger were native Vermonters. Mm-hmm. And then third... A part of the question, which I think you asked first. Yeah, they came to many of the shows. Again, they weren't okay. stage door parents. Yeah. You know, there's my little son. But, yeah. you know, but they came to many, and dad yeah. had a great laugh. And yeah. uh, now I'll say this again about the mm-hmm. parental thing. My parents would, I, my, I had a fiddle, I have a fiddle player always, in the, mm-hmm. not always in the show, but sometimes. Mm-hmm. And I had this fiddle player who was my buddy since we were 15, and his wife took the tickets for like the first 15 years. Yeah, and then they knew my parents real well, you know. Mm-hmm. And my when my parents would come to a show, maybe it's in Johnson, maybe it's in South Burlington, um, they always paid. Oh, you know, so God. Peaches, the, the yeah. woman's name was Peaches, who took the tickets. Of course, hey yeah. Marilyn, hey Bill, how you doing? And yeah. hey, you don't have to pay. They would always pay. Okay. So that was bad news for anybody I would hire to be in my shows because I would only give them two comps. That was for their parents, but I wasn't like, here, here's six comps. Because yeah. of my parents yeah. pay to see my show. Of course, I yeah. didn't want them to. Yeah. That, then people aren't going to get in free much, you know? So yeah. that, that goes to show you, yeah. you know, they, they would, they, they, that their son was doing a thing here and they're going to pay. That was just the old mentality, you know? That's, a, that's very sweet. I thought that's, that's, you know, that's cool. You know, that's, yeah. that's, that's very nice parents. I, I admire that, that quality and that, but, um, so I want to get now into the logger and, and now, all right, so we knew that the, the Genesis was this, this character in, in, in the, in the Judenal play, but you started coming up with the stories on your trip back from trips back from New York, back to Vermont. You start coming up with the stories. My first question is what, I mean, maybe you already answered this because of the character, um, Amon Gillino, who was a logger, but why comedy? Was it um, because you were more of a serious actor? You even said you, at the beginning of the conversation, you liked serious plays more. Why did you kind of go in on this being comedy and maybe not so more like a drama comedy or black comedy, I'm sorry, is what they call it. Why, why pure comedy? Or did it not start out that way? No, it started out that way. <clears throat> there's okay. a really just one answer to that. More, there's more than one, but there's one basic one. When I was growing up, mm-hmm. there was a guy, now you, you sound like you're hip, uh, so there was a guy oh, named Marshall okay. Dodge. You know who okay. Marshall Dodge? I don't know Marshall Dodge. Did you ever hear of Bert and I? Bert. It sounds familiar. And, uh, so this. It so it's familiar. the Mainer. It's the okay. Mainer. Okay. Of the logger. Okay. And this guy was named Marshall Dodge, and the other guy's name was Tim Sample. Mm-hmm. Marshall Dodge was a guy that went to Yale, and he was really smart. And he and and they did these stories, but they mm-hmm. were main characters, and they're mm-hmm. brilliant. So you must. Google or somehow get Bert and I stories, Marshall Dodge and Tim Sample. So I'm telling you, I listened to them when I was a kid. 
So put all being in a lot of plays together, being in being in uh, musicals, being in serious plays, and then what comes out of me. But th the way that Marshall Dodge did the stories, okay. and there's also a kind of a thought in my mind and many people's mind of what old storytelling is. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mark Twain, mm -hmm. those type of things that, that, that it's not the monologue, the, the Spalding Gray, more modern, very uh, topical things. Yeah. It wasn't that. It yeah. wasn't, that wasn't the feel I have. Yeah. The feel I have is the old time of thing. You're talking about an old way of living the working class, getting up every morning you know, not feeding yourself nutritious food, <laughs> you know, hard, yeah. hard scrabble. So yeah. that the sensibility of the way those stories came out was because of what was in my ear from Marshall Dodge. Okay. The old type stories that they tell mm -hmm. around the deer camp, the mm -hmm. old classic stories. And although I'd rather do drama movies and TV, mm -hmm. um, I, uh, I am, I, I have a fun, I'm funny. I can be yeah. funny. And I knew that when I was a kid, I could, I could be funny. Okay. So I wanted, I wanted those stories to be funny. Yeah. So, um, so the, these, the, 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 these stories that start coming up while you're driving back from New York, like, yeah. it's great. You're capturing these stories down. Now you have all these different characters that you, you do, you, you know, you have Marshall Buker and you, Jenny Templeton. Now are these people that, are these people based on people that you know? Obviously, I'm assuming you're not using real names, but are do you take do you take people from your real life and make them maybe almost like a caricature of themselves? Is, is Marshall Buker based on somebody that you know from real life? Yes, and Marshall Buker okay. would be the most the most direct pull from a from one human. Okay. The other one's the character Little. Yep. Jenny Templeton is is the every yeah, it's, it's a girl, you know. It's yeah, a young yeah. Girl. Is the yeah. every girl that yeah, we girl think of, we have to watch what you say these days, you know. But you yeah. think that work, <laughs> she works at the diner. Yeah, and she didn't do so well in school, and her mom yeah. worked at the diner too. She's yeah. really nice yeah. to everybody, and uh, she's yeah. ahead of her time. So yeah. that's the Jenny. I didn't take Jenny Templeton from anybody, but Marshall Buker was the yeah. guy. The guy used to live. In fact, his son just died. <laughs> guy used to live four miles up the road. His name was Norman okay. Keith. Okay. I had his wife over for dinner the other night. One yeah. of his sons over for dinner the other night, yeah. his wife and their kid. So he was a, a little, the character little is an amalgamation, yeah. but yeah. I'd say 65% one guy mm -hmm. I worked with at concrete. Mm -hmm. So if you want to talk writing, yeah, I know when I wrote that character little, I was yeah. walking, I was in the subway yeah. down, 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 you know, in the below the streets in New York city, yeah. taking a long subway trip back from Staten Island to my apartment in New York City. And I came up with Little, which yeah. is a very rural, you know, but in the New York suburb, I came up with them. And the real Little, it has had a lot of fuzzy hair <laughs> and no teeth. He was only like mm -hmm. 35 years old. Yeah. And, but so, so that's a lot of fuzzy hair and no teeth. So when I, uh, you know, when I describe Little the first time you hear about him, I go, mm -hmm. I got a friend named Little. We call him Little because he's Little. Well, the yeah. real Little was skinny and Little. Yeah. And he says very little, and the real little said very little. Yeah, got little eyes. The real little, the real little had little eyes. Yeah, and but then I just went with little teeth, <laughs> and he didn't have any teeth. Little bit of hair off on top of his head sticks up a little. Well, little yeah. had a lot of hair, so yeah. I took the thing. The first three things about little that I'm writing are mm -hmm. really that person I know, but mm -hmm. then it came out alliteration yeah. was showing itself to me. Mm -hmm. So instead of going, but he's got no teeth, yeah. and but tons of hair. I just yeah. had to make boom, 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 the beat, the rhythm of it. Mm -hmm. yeah. But mostly the reason I call him little is because don't no matter what's going on around him, he's always got a little smile going. <laughs> yeah. Now I don't yeah. remember. I don't remember the little yeah. just always smiling, but he had an upbeat attitude, and he used to get picked on. And his yeah. name wasn't Little. His name was something, Lynn. Lynn. His name was Lynn. L Y N N. Yeah. It was a guy. <laughs> so, so yeah. I mean, those yeah. characters. Some people just come up with them, but I, I mine yeah. are mostly you know tapestries or quilts. Mm -hmm. But the, but the Marshall Buker is really yeah. a lot of this one guy. 
And that's why I, that's why I, I if, you know, I, I suggest everyone get this because there is not one piece of comedy that's not in this, in this special. There's physical comedy, play on words, straight stand up, storytelling. I mean, it's, there's everything in that performance. When you came up with these characters and you said you were, you, you thought it on the, on this train back to New York, um, did you create a, a, like almost like a composite? You said like, um, like this Jenny Templeton was kind of like a composite of this, like every girl of Vermont, you know, Vermont high school girls, you know, was she, were, did you kind of create everything about a character almost like, a, like an author does? Like when an author writes a book, they'll create like a whole background of a character, even if that background never makes into a book. They create this background and, the you know, did you do something similar with your characters? Okay. You just had straight story. Okay. No, I, I did that. I did, did I do that when I act called okay. backstory. I might yeah. have you know fifteen lines, but I, I want to know you mm -hmm. know how that kid grew up and everything. But with my characters, no, because mm -hmm. as I write this stuff, it just mm -hmm. comes out. So mm -hmm. I got a friend named Lidl. We call him Lidl because he's <laughs> Lidl. He says very little. He's got little eyes, little teeth, a little bit of hair up on top. Mostly the reason I call him Lidl is because no matter what's going on around him, he's always got a little smile going. Boom, now that exists. Yeah. That's how I write that. So that exists that way. Now, yeah. as I use it in front of people, I can change it and all, but mostly that's how it exists. So the Jenny Templeton, the 16 year old yeah. junior in high school, yeah. <laughs> I needed to have this girl yeah. who, who was, who was uh, you know, trying to be pulled water skiing. Mm -hmm. And she just happened to be a, a young girl that I described. And once I describe her, then that person happened to be, as I described her, that girl that works at the diner, yeah. the yeah. girl that works at Big Lots. I didn't, I didn't get up that morning going, you know what I want to do tomorrow? I want to create a, that character, that diner okay. girl yeah. who, who gets, has a child mm -hmm. with a guy. or something. No, I don't start that way. I start, it comes out almost like poetry, almost like, almost like you, you jump off from a very high place with wings yeah and you don't know where you're going into so you just jump you don't yeah. go i'm gonna fly there 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 you just come and the wind takes you that's how it happens and I, then you can say yeah. oh look look what this character is yeah it's a rural uh hard working mm -hmm. logger now yeah. what you can do with that mm -hmm. is you can say well it's 2022 mm -hmm. why don't i make him a rural hardworking logger who is uh transgender okay you know yeah. so so once i have that thing once the words have mm -hmm. come out then i can i'm not going to just stick to that yeah i can go anywhere with that and that i think yeah is where things can really become interesting yeah no i i totally agree that'd be, that'd but they be... could it can be a backstory too it can yeah. be that that person when i'm yeah. creating that and talking about it that person does have some sort of a thing that's very unique but and i don't have to say it or i can say it as a as a mechanism in the story if i want okay now when you tell these stories when i hear you tell this story and you can talk about what you just did there with little it is so tight and every word has a place just like how you like every there is no fat to it you it is it is it is constructed like a work of art that you um, somehow memorized now did you write this down? I'm assuming as a comic, and I watched another comedian tell for like that, that you've had to write this down. There is no way that this just stayed in your head and you're able to come up with something so tight and exact and the timing's perfect and delivery is on point and you know to move your body in certain directions at certain parts. Are these stories written down at all? Yeah. You're okay. very astute. You're very astute. Yeah, the first, the first logger that was a kind of like a play. Yeah. I had a, you know, I had a character arc and a, and a mm -hmm. story arc in it. And I, I did the fourth wall. I did. So that mm -hmm. was all written down word for word. And I learned it and mm -hmm. I, and I did it the same, you know, with a little bit of deviation here, here, and yeah. here, and there. And I the movie is where you see a copy of that. Do you still have, do you still have these written down? You oh yeah. I, I think I have those up in my little attic here. They're, they're, please, you send know, those me. Long, please send me. I would love to see that. As those a long fan, yellow, yeah, Those long yellow things. Yeah, the word, word for word. If, if word you get a chance, I would love to get but, a copy of that. Just, a, just, a, just a screenshot. That. That's twenty five okay. years ago. I don't work that way anymore, mostly. Okay, but 
Mm-hmm. I do it kind of as a, for many reasons. I do it as a challenge. Some of the stuff is word for word. When you hear me do it, you hear me one night, you hear me the next night, it's the same stuff. You're like, boy, that's, that's exact. Yeah. But what I do is I sit in that barn and mm-hmm. I'll come up with two or three lines and I'll keep going over it and over it and over it until it is in my head. Then the mm-hmm. next day, go over it and over it. So, cause I want this type of this, that certain story to be the same every night. Cause I know how it works and, and I'm going to build on that. And the timing is going to come, you know, with, yeah. with your, you know, it's the same It's comedy. I mean, some guys yeah. go out there with a the form yeah, and then they let it go. Yeah. Some guys and girls go out there with specific, just Seinfeld is very specific. Mm-hmm. I, I know that. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so now I'm working both, both ways. I don't necessarily write it down much, but, um, but also once I get a three or four lines or, or a mm-hmm. paragraph, I'll put it on the damned iPhone. Okay. So if I don't rehearse that for two weeks, it's yeah. on there. Yeah, good, good. That's, that's, now, now, why the logger? Now, I think you might have already answered this question with the fact that it comes from the Jellino character who was a logger. But in your in your in your depth of professions, logging is the most brief of those professions. Why did you not make the character a concrete worker or a school bus driver or um, you know uh, uh, you know a gas station attendant or a UPS driver? Why did you stick with the logger or did you already answer with because Jellino is a logger used kind of like that? No, uh, no, um, there is, there is, con- I do say that in this, in the story about Little with his one legged dog. Yeah. I yep. do say that, you know, Summers, right. when, when Log and Slow and Little and I were creators, we pour concrete. So I do mm-hmm. go into the concrete. Uh, the logging, because I, I had a romantic, romantic vision, uh, romantic uh, thoughts about that when I was a kid. Mm-hmm. the logging and uh, before before no not before and i did end up logging and um and mm-hmm. theatrically when i started the logger mm-hmm. it wasn't named the logger i was going to do two stories at a talent show that my buddy was producing good buddy of mine he's older than me he's very talented yeah. and he and he was backstage and he was going to introduce me and he mm-hmm. said, "What do you?" Right before he went out, he likes to work just at the last moment. What do you want to be called? He says, "What do you want to be called?" And Big Red. He goes, "What do you want to be called?" Big Red. And I said, "No, call me the Logger," because theatrically, what I do in the first one, as you know, mm-hmm. I think it's on the first video. I yep. walk out on stage silently, yes, with an imaginary chainsaw, and I get the chainsaw yep. stuck. So yeah. that I created. I didn't say I want to be called the Logger. Yeah. I want this character to be a Logger. What yeah. I did is thought I'm going to do these stories and I'm, I got, I, I want to be, I want to catch people's, uh, this is how I want to start it with this whole mm-hmm. thing. Yeah. So he then became, he was the, he was the logger. That's how that became that way. Again, okay. I wasn't driving home in my car yeah. from New York city thinking I'm going to write about logger logger. Just, you know, just embodies what a real working class person is. Okay. But I, now- I, I yeah. So that's that. Okay. Now, um, the, from, from the, from the day that you started coming up with your first story, which I want to know what your first story for the logger was to this, how long are we talking here? That's a good question. Um, uh, I think I was doing this a semblance of, the logger, the the, mm-hmm. the first story about the deer jacking and and the little. Okay. I wrote those. I wrote the deer jacking one first. First, okay. And the little one second. And I wrote those within two or three weeks of each other. And okay. Within about four months, I was performing them very menially. Okay. At, at a little, you know, there was a place in White River Junction. I did it, and. uh and then it was George's show. I did it. Okay. So within three or four months, but then it was like, I guess your next question would be, <laughs> then, then, then how, how long till I started producing myself? <laughs> Probably six months. I, I started producing myself that fall with a, um, with a tour. Okay. I, tour I, wanna, I definitely want to get into that, but I want to know. You kind of you kind of gave me like the so you start you wrote two stories the deer jacking one which I figured was your first one because that's the first story that you talk about it's like it's it's you know it's I can see I can see why you start out with that story and that's why the that's the first one um, so you started out a talent show you did two stories tell me about how you grew this act because 
I, like, I don't, I, I want to know how, because it's such a unique thing and it, and it takes time for people to understand, like you, like we have open mics and you get five minutes. There's no way you can do what you do in five minutes. I mean, tell me, tell me how you started getting the stories down, you know, and just like the first, like two to three, three to four weeks is what you mentioned, how you started assembling this act together. Well, that's very, you're very right. Um, yeah. So I did a, I did like a probably six or seven shows with mm -hmm. my friend George, those okay. two stories. And that gave me each of those stories, like eight, nine minutes. Yeah. That gave me a lot of information that the story, they were good. It was good. Yeah. It was good. I liked doing it and people liked it. Then mm -hmm. there was, a, you know, the thing called first night, you know what first nights are? Oh, it, like the it, first night of the month, they have like an art, like, like, like no. artist. Oh no. Okay. Never mind. I don't no, know. New Year's Eve in cities okay. like in Burlington, you take, it's a, it's a family thing and they take the whole city of Burlington over and the, the jugglers are in this building and the, the music guys are in this building and the dancers are in that building. It's a whole big thing. And there's 40,000 people come. Mm -hmm. So I said, Boy, I'm gonna call up first night. I was still in New York doing act, acting and working together. Jeez. I'm gonna call up first night yeah. and see if they'll if, see if I can perform at first night. That was always kind of a big thing growing up. But <laughs> everybody would go to first night in Burlington and the families and you. Yeah. Oh man, it'd be a thing at the Flynn. And the, and the guy said, "Yeah, we'll hire." I've heard that you do these stories and water. Mm -hmm. But I heard that you cuss. I said, "Yeah, it's rated SC, some cussing." <laughs> he says, yeah. "Well, we need content." We'll put a disclaimer out in front of your show. <laughs> so I did five shows at first night. But here's yeah. the answer to your question. Yeah. You needed 40 minutes. Yeah. Okay. Oh. I had less than 20. Okay. So this is kind of like, and I don't really have the timeline that good, but mm -hmm. this is this gives me two or three months to get yeah. uh, 40 minutes up for first night. Okay. So then I started writing, 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 writing. Yeah. And then, and you know what? Stuff was good, I guess, because I yeah. went to do it. At I went to do it at first night. Yeah. It was good. You know, I I had a. It was all about. It was all about the Flatlanders moving to New York. It was about the the Vermonter. Mm -hmm. again, you know, not the Vermonter against the Flatland, but but yeah. what's the Flatlander? What what do the Vermonter think about the Flatlanders? Those real woodchucks. Yeah. You know, real, real woodchucks, you know, shovel their snow off the deck once a year and then slide <laughs> down, there, shoot yeah. their deer from it, you know, all yeah. those things. Yeah. And, and I had a, I had 20, I had 34 years of experience with that, yeah. you know, yeah. so that all came out really fast. So then I had my 40 minutes. So then I was at first night, I did five shows, the whole Chittenden County, the northern part of Vermont saw yeah. me and people went nuts. And then I said, yeah. well, yeah. With Judavine, with Robert Ringer, we had toured yeah. shows. Yeah. I, I, I had entree to come and go to the job I had in New York. I could come and go anytime. Okay. So I think I'm going to call up some, I didn't, oh, you're, you're probably going to get into this, but anyway, yeah. so I, I'll stop, I'll stop there. I'll say, <laughs> so, so it was, so, so I wrote, you're more in the writing. So I yeah. wrote it and I had 20 minutes. I said, I got to get 40. I wrote the stuff. Lucky for me. Yeah. The first time I did it, I knew the first two stories, 20 minutes, were really good by then. Yeah. So they were really good. And the second 20 minutes happened to be really good too. <laughs> but it didn't oh, but, it, did, gun. but yeah. it didn't have to be. Because yeah. if you're doing five minutes at an open mic, yeah. you only need about two minutes to be to be good. You yeah. know what I mean? But it but it was. So then I was like, whoa. <laughs> whoa. And th then I wrote a whole god darn hour and 45 freaking minutes, you know. <laughs> That's awesome. Now, so so the first I, I the first time you do this at the talent show though, and you're doing what you know it's it's one of the most boldest stars to a to a comedy show because you come out and you don't say anything and you do your chainsaw act, which like what name one special where the first four minutes there's no talking like the talent had to name one it doesn't happen, and then you do Dear Jackie you do Little, that first time you did it. Were people on board right away or were they like, what the hell do we just watch? Like, what did that first show go like? Well, you're a comedian and I had done plays and I, I loved the very child and Jew divine. Yeah. So I, I've been in really successful things. It was a goddamn most exciting thing you've ever done. You know, I go out there and I do that chainsaw. Yeah. And from the moment I walk out there holding that chainsaw, looking up at that tree and knocking on that fake mm -hmm. tree and you know, making the noise with my foot. And then I mm -hmm. start that chainsaw there's about 600 people there and every yeah. one of them, I had every one of them in the palm of my hand. <laughs> and, and 
and I knew that. Yeah. It, it wasn't like I was a postal clerk who doesn't yeah. get on stage a lot. Yeah. You know, I, I'd gotten on stage a lot to that point in my life, uh, a lot, you mm -hmm. know, and um, so I knew it and it was just, and then I got into the, the content of it mm -hmm. and I, and I didn't know that it would go as well as it did, but it, it, it I just happened to have a good ear yeah. when I wrote it and it worked and people got it and I was well rehearsed. Yeah. And it was to the milli degree of a comma and a parenthesis. And I stuck with it. I was committed and I was, and I'm a performer and I, mm -hmm. and I was prepared and no, right away. But mm -hmm. people always ask me, do you get nervous? I was, I was very nervous then, but right yeah. away, then the second night when I'm coming to them yeah. to do Georgia. So I don't know if it's going to go well that second night, <laughs> but then it does. Okay. And it's consistent because I'm consistent. Okay. I, you know, so it's just a freak, just goddamn exciting. You can't even imagine. That's awesome. Now, I, I, now, did you, when you say you were well rehearsed, did you rehearse it with anybody ahead of time? Did you get your parents together? Did you get like your boss no. No, just by yourself? Wow. I've always, always rehearsed plays and things. I don't, I don't rehearse in front of the mirror. Some people do. Yeah. Always, it's, it's always rehearse play. Like I rehearse right in this room here uh, uh, and I'll be rehearsing tomorrow, most all day for Saturday mm -hmm. show and Thursday. But, Friday, but um, I just rehearse by myself and uh no no i wasn't doing a tryout audience but but i'm not saying that that isn't a good thing to do yeah that, that's yeah. a good thing to do but yeah. I, I never did it that way I, I i guess it's just all your years of being in like a live audience performance you just and you said like what you what 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 did you learn from being in community theater i learned delivery i learned delivery through the armand jeleno character you just have an innate by the time the logger came about to performance you have an innate ear to when when the beasts need to be written when you know when to pause don't get flustered i mean if i did your chain if i tried to copy your chainsaw act i would have i would have killed over in four seconds because i wasn't getting responses so the fact that you stuck with it the payoff was so much bigger at the end i, I just admire that so much um now i love the logger i, I promise we'll move on to other things about it. i just love your first special so much it's, it's like a warm blanket i i you got you you start out with the Uncle Furman skit. I, I like the Uncle Furman because it sets for the viewer, for someone who's not in Vermont. Now, the reason I heard about you is my aunt was in Vermont. I was give her a shout, Amy Tuzio. And when I started doing stand-up, she sent me this as a Christmas gift. She's like, this is what you need to learn. <laughs> so, so I'll give her a shout out on that. Um, what? But I like that, you know, I like that the Uncle Furman thing gets you into the context that there's a logger. You know, you're this character um, and what's what's going to happen. The Uncle Furman thing. Did you was this a skit that you had performed out prior? Like, where did this character come from? Did you put that together the day of or did you also incorporate that part? Because that doesn't happen on stage. Did you incorporate that as part of your live shows prior? No. I, when I, I was been doing it for quite a few years. The logger I'd been doing the logger mm -hmm. play. And then I thought then I added a band to diversify for myself yeah. and for my audience. And then I would, <laughs> I would do Christmas shows, and I would, and then and I did, I, I did Uncle Furman, and, and I had him read, I had him read a um, Cajun. It's called, it's literally called Cajun Night Before Christmas. Okay. So it's the night, it's the night before Christmas, but it's it's done in the bayou, and, and mm -hmm. Santa shows up on a, in a boat, a bateau, with uh, alligators pulling the sled. Yeah. So I do Uncle Furman, then they pulled the sled, and so so I would. That's the first time. You're right. Uncle yeah. Furman didn't exist in the show. He was just yeah. in the little taped bits before my yeah. DVD uh, videos at that point. But I would mm -hmm. use Uncle Furman and and, and uh, a lot of, and it was, you know, people loved the Uncle Furman character. Mm -hmm. And um, it was really, come think of it, smart yeah. that, that I would just bring him out at these little Christmas shows. And thousands and thousands of people would go to these Christmas. I'd do like yeah. 20 every other Christmas. And, uh, the fact that they didn't see him much made it all the more attractive, you know, less, okay. less is more. Yeah. And it worked. I just wanted to do him. I wanted to put the gear on. Plus, yeah. you know, at that point they've been seeing me a lot. So and that yeah. show them a different uh, view of mine. And yeah. yeah. I had to tell you how dumb I am. It probably took the third viewing of probably 300 viewings of your special I've seen now 
to realize that was you. <laughs> if I did, if I did the third and realize that was you. But what makes what makes it, I love the Uncle Fermi character, but what it, what makes it even funnier is that there's a guy with him that's like totally awkward on camera. That makes it even fun. That that whoever that guy was, I don't know who he was, but. I thought he was also a perfect addition, just so awkward in the scene with, with you doing your character. I thought that yeah, was so funny. At the farm, you mean Merle Ramo? I, I don't I, I don't think his name was ever given. He just sits next to Uncle Furman and you're like conversing with them. And he's so he's yeah. so not he still doesn't understand what's going on, but you're just playing off him kind of yeah, thing. He's just, you know? He was just a local guy that worked at the egg farm and and I knew him. And uh, yep. that made his goddamn day to be involved <laughs> in that. And I, and I, and, and again, I never, yeah. you know, I have joke you, you, when you, I joke about things, I have material, mm -hmm. but you know, perhaps he was, he was um, a guy that probably didn't do great in the SATs, <laughs> but yeah. he was, he wasn't making fun of that. Yeah. Uh, the uncle Furman and the logger, the whole idea of this is, Fucking, and you may be answer asking this later, but yeah. it's good you brought up him. Um, yeah. uh, is that we're all the same? I yeah. Mean, I, I mean, I'm big on that, really big on that. Yeah. So that I can have a guy there, and he and he was just getting joy out of being in this in this part. I mean, the guy awesome. was a hero. He was a hero, yeah. but it went really well. It's, it's, yeah. that's, that's life, you know. Well, I just like the fact that he obviously had no training, and you're just playing off him. Like you don't oh. get. You don't get like he's definitely not giving you you know scenes to work with. You're doing it. You're doing all the heavy lifting, and it's just it's it's just good. I like it. I just want to put that aside. Thanks. Um, so then I you you incorporate which I wish more special. You incorporate the green room in your blogger space. We see you interacting with the fiddler guy and your and the people coming in. I just like that. It brings you. It makes me feel like I'm there in the Vermont Opera House with everybody else. First question is: Was it a conscious decision to include the green room stuff? And then secondly, why do you have a fit? I guess answer that question first. And then why has a fiddler always been a staple of the logger from the 90s to present day? Yeah, I mean, I had been in New York and making films mm -hmm. and things. And I'm not a I'm not a learned guy. I'm not an mm -hmm. educated guy. I didn't study film. But mm -hmm. you, you kind of know mm -hmm. that if you're trying to make a little con comedy concert, mm -hmm. that if you show you the guy backstage mm -hmm. first, mm -hmm. it creates a little bit of buildup. Yeah. So that's all that was. I liked it. And, I really liked it. And then when I'm starting to do the live show, I'm going to mm -hmm. do live shows after mm -hmm. after the first night and everything, and after George's uh, the tryout of the talent shows. My buddy that I grew up, I played drums mm -hmm. in bands back when they had bands and VFWs and stuff. Yeah. It's my buddy Don, and I just thought I want to go out and do this play, and I don't want it, and I and I want something more than a guy on stage, mm -hmm. and I grew up hearing the old time fiddle. I was mm -hmm. playing drums since when I was 14 to the old time fiddle in mm -hmm. the real Vermonters. Mm -hmm. with their thumb, their fingers are big as my arm. <laughs> They're playing the fiddle. And then you go after the fiddle contest, you go to their houses at night and their wives, they make the food and you sit around. Mm -hmm. If you put that in a show, mm -hmm. if you put a fiddle in a show, not only does it break up the fact that there's only one other guy in it who is me, mm -hmm. but it brings all of that into it, mm -hmm. that pedigree, that patina of the old time fiddle is a deeply, deeply, you know, sacred Vermont rural mm -hmm. thing. Yeah. So if you're, you're supplying that at a show, at a theater mm -hmm. show, that's very effective. Yeah. So that's yeah. why that's why I have that. Yeah, and no, I have I'm, that to this day. Cause yeah, I mean it's it's so untraditional because the traditional thing is a comic will have an opener, another comic open from the warm up the room. You literally go on with a fiddler, and then you know you do a, a, a silent act, and then you get into it. I mean, it's incredible. It just shows the comedic genius that you have that you have to be able to take like a fiddler player. That's providing no like people aren't getting really warmed up to comedy during a fiddler play, and then you go right into a sign act. I you know all the credit in the world to you, Rusty. Thanks. Um, um, so you go right into the deer, the chainsaw thing, and then the deer jacking joke. How much? And that was your first joke. How much did that joke change from when you performed it at the Allen show to when I see it on the Logger special? Did it change a lot, or did it not change at all, or very little? You talking about a specific joke? The, yeah, the deer jacking joke. 
Oh, that whole yeah. that whole deer check. No, yeah. I mean, I wrote that again. Yeah, a local man mm-hmm. of some, a local man of some note. Okay, got caught deer, got caught deer jacking. <laughs> and I remember I was at a, a little uh, somebody's house for dinner in mm-hmm. Snow. There's about four or five people over. And I remember mm-hmm. it was icy. It was icy that night, and I was and I got in the car drive. I was mm-hmm. going to drive. 13 minutes to my house and I was thinking of this guy that was in a newspaper and people were talking about him. Well, he's a good guy. I know him. He's still alive. Yeah. And um, I, f- I freaking wrote that. I wrote that first part. I wrote okay. that whole deer jacking part. And, yeah. and now were you recording yourself early on to see like, all right, this part of the deer jacking joke wasn't hitting so well, but like, is there stuff that you added to it that wasn't in that initial story? Like, did you, what editing and, and manipulation did you do to deer jacking to kind of like, keep building upon it to what we see as the final product yeah so if if that whole just deer jacking part is yeah. like two, two minutes and yeah. 50 seconds or let's say it's three minutes and 10 seconds mm-hmm. when i write it it's three minutes and 20 seconds mm-hmm. then i do it and i do it and i do it. it's just like comedy yeah uh, that you do uh you're driving home this is actually how i define talent right here okay so, so you're driving home and you're remembering what the audience laughed at where that had to speed up you, you mm. stop you, you slowed down a little bit too much there well oh, oh guess what i don't need that word so then the next night you mm. do it you do things naturally that you didn't even edit out literally <laughs> the day of yeah you do them naturally because you feel it you feel it coming up so then at the end of seven or eight or nine or ten or a dozen times doing it you have come upon the final cake Okay. And I define talent as <clears throat> basically if you can, you can do your five minute set and you mm-hmm. can tape it if you want and everything, Yeah. but you can do your five minute set. I don't care if you tape it or not. When you're driving home, mm-hmm. you're going through it. I define talent as being the person that's able to go from that night's hear it, play it back on their head, realize where some, changes and adjustments can may go Mm -hmm. make those and have many of them be the right adjustments they don't all have to be wow that's what i call that's what i call talent (laughs) that's incredible that's that's absolutely incredible um and i because let let me yeah let me just say go ahead i i don't don't mean to be disrespectful to you but anybody yeah not anybody many, Mm -hmm. many people get literally they can't go on stage. It's, it's, a, it's mm-hmm. a thing. They're affected by it. But every, everybody can tell a joke. Yeah. Knock, knock. Who's there, man? Yeah. You know, some people, it's not as funny. Yeah. But, but you know, if I write a joke, you, can, you said you couldn't do the chainsaw. Well, you can. And I bet if you kept doing that chainsaw, you'd finally figure it out. That's the talent. Yeah. Anybody can go out there and memorize the thing and do it over and over and over again. But to mm-hmm. make it work, yeah, that's that's the talent to edit it, to push it, to make a different word, to mm-hmm. you know that that's a ta- that's a talented person. Not everybody can do that. Yeah. Okay. Now I I like so you start doing you start doing I I could, I define that the first logger movie is actually there's two parts to it. The first part is a character is a character comedy special where you're the logger and these are stories that happen in the logger's life. But it's funny. It needs a live audience. I don't think that act, that, that act would work, you know, in front of like a laugh track or, or not. I think it needed, you needed the energy of the audience being on board with you. Um, the second part though, is as soon as, you, as soon as you go into the Flatlanders thing, I feel that all of a sudden the logger character drops. And now it's Rusty Deweese doing stand-up comedy. That's why, because you start doing joke, 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 there's no more stories. It's just jokes and they're hidden. What? So tell me, like, did you purposely build your set to do stories at the first, jokes at the end, or it just happened to naturally go that way? The, the, it, it happened to naturally go that way. I wrote mm-hmm. the stories first. I wrote mm-hmm. the stories first. Then I wanted to do first night. I needed more time. Yeah, okay. And <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't say, I'll write another story. Uh, what okay. I woke up doing was yeah. writing jokes. And here's why. Yeah. It's, it, may, it may be a weakness in, in the long run. Um, Jerry Seinfeld mm-hmm. had done the same kind of comedy his whole comedy career. He's mm-hmm. one of the best that's ever done, Tally. Mm-hmm. Uh, Richard Pryor. Mm-hmm. When they did those comedy things, they were the same throughout. 
the Beatles, when they did an album, it was an album those days. Mm -hmm. It was consistent. Me, mm -hmm. I like to do two of these uh, lyrical, poetic stories. Mm -hmm. But that's enough of that, man. I want to hit <laughs> some. I want to hit some quick jokes. That's what I kind of like. Well, mm -hmm. as a if you're if you're taking names about who goes down in the history of being a storyteller or a, or a, or a comedian, I'm left behind in that. But here's where it benefited me. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Here's where it benefited me in my little career of 25 mm -hmm. years living in Vermont, living out, is that then I started getting calls from companies and they wanted me to do a Christmas party. Okay. Right? So then I got it started to call from schools and they wanted mm -hmm. me to come entertain the kids. So I had all this different type of stuff. Now the school kids loved the lyrical stories mm -hmm. and some, and many of the Christmas party companies like the, the long stories too, mm -hmm. but I wouldn't want to do a 50 minute set, which is what you get hired for a banquet show or an hour. Yeah. yeah. I wouldn't want to do a 50 minute set for mm -hmm. the new England realtors association <laughs> yeah. where there are people coming from Rhode Island yeah. and people are coming. That's not, you know, Lay, mm -hmm. lay people will say, boy, them people from Connecticut don't get those Vermont jokes. Well, you know what? Mm -hmm. They do get them. Yeah. But, but, but it's, but a little bit of it is lost on them, mm -hmm. you know, because people are smart and uh, even the, the logger stories mm -hmm. are very apl applicable to anybody. Oh, yeah. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't want, you know, there's people coming from Hawaii for the United States Religious Association and all, mm -hmm. and they love them. People in yeah. Hawaii know that the logger type person exists because yeah. the person from Hawaii who is at the realtors conference in Vermont mm -hmm. is jazzing that they're in Vermont. Mm -hmm. So yeah. they, they get my thing, but yeah. I wanted there to be jokes. And, and it's, so it's mostly because of me yeah. because I like a bunch of different things. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I, and, and, well, I think to your point about people from Hawaii is that the log character is very relatable. Like I said, I mean, I have cousins in Vermont. I haven't been to Vermont that often, but I get what you're doing. When I see Marshall Buker, I understand who you are. Right. You right. do so much, it, you know, the devil's in the detail. There's so much detail into it. And you're, I mean, you literally put your body into the work. I think at one point you turn around the big water and your whole back is drenched in sweat yeah. at one point in the thing. So, I mean, I think it's just, this, this character is very relatable. You're not using inside jokes. You're not like in references to like, you know, specific names of places in the special. We get who this character is. Have you ever tried the logger in other locations? I mean, there's been, there's logging in Nevada and California and, and Texas. Have you tried log the logger character in other places? And has that, if you have, has that worked? Well, yeah, o only a, a couple. And it's because somebody would hire me to okay. go to you know, Maine, Maine, well, Maine's mm -hmm. law. But, but, but the reason I don't, didn't expand beyond Vermont is because I'm I, like Woody Allen. He shoots mm -hmm. in New York. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, he shot other places recently, but yeah. Um, I wanted to just be home in Vermont. Okay. But also, um, uh, what was it? Why have I tried the other character in other places? Um, yeah. Basically I just, I just want to be in Vermont and, and okay. up, up rural New York and New Hampshire. Oh, mm -hmm. Oh, so if somebody said, I, I tried it in Boston. I did. Mm -hmm. I, I, I produced myself maybe the fifth year, sixth year I was doing it at the mm -hmm. Institute of Contemporary Art in Boylston Street. And I, mm -hmm. and I got into the Phoenix. They did it. In, uh, but uh, it, here's the, here's the key. It was take me because I produced myself mm -hmm. and I had 34 years of growing up here. I mm -hmm. had done some Hollywood movies, mm -hmm. my little local area. Everybody knows you. So they all mm -hmm. came out from that. And then it was on Vermont public television as a pledge thing. The whole state saw it. Mm -hmm. You can blanket the whole state with something like this in Vermont because there's 600,000 people in Vermont. <laughs> so I went to Boston and like, mm -hmm. crap, you not. I did 20 shows uh, <laughs> over a course of four weekends, five shows yeah. a weekend. There were four people there the first night. And then the, and the last night, I think there's a 70 seat theater. It was full, but it would take too much money. Yeah. To, to gain an audience. Okay. Know? Interesting. Yeah. Going based on that point about producing your own shows, you had to, you, it sounds like you had a very grassroots building up of the logger. Tell me what you did post first night to start pouring. What did, what was your, 
what was your game plan? What was your strategy? If um, this, this, this web series is about advice to comics and, and part of what I would like to know is like, I don't do much touring outside of the Philadelphia area. What advice would you tell me if I have an act kind of relating to your story? What did you do to bring the logger to other audiences, which is also beneficial because then you have more people weighing in on your material to make it better. Well, it wasn't prior to first night. Let's let's just say okay. first night was integral okay. in telling me that a mass of people like me. Okay. And I stood there at the last of five shows on at City Hall in Burlington in the Flynn mm-hmm. Theaters. The, it's our biggest theater in Vermont. Mm-hmm. It was to my right, and I said this literally because with Judavine we had we had done the Flynn Theater. Okay. Robert Ringer, we toured it. We ended mm-hmm. up the Flynn Theater. I said to myself, honest to God, I said I'm going to do a tour of this as I'm on stage, and people are going mm-hmm. nuts. I'm going to do a tour of this and I'm going to end it at the Flynn theater, 1400 people. So I set up the tour like in one town and mm-hmm. then 30 miles today. I spent all day putting posters up Yeah, 60 okay. miles from here in Barton yeah. where I'm doing a show February 12th. Um, still putting the posters up, talking to the little girls that own the store. Um, mm-hmm. I'll do it. I'll do it in Morrisville. I'll do it in Montpelier because everybody in Morrisville has relatives in Montpelier. <laughs> and man, when you saw this the first time, you told yeah. people about it, you know. So Montpelier, they'd come. And then the radio, maybe the radio stations will think I'm funny and then they'll have me on. Well, mm-hmm. they did. Yeah. Maybe each newspaper will start hearing about it and they'll do a feature on me. Mm-hmm. And they'll they'll mention that I was in Black Dog with Patrick Swayze. And mm-hmm. then people will come and they've heard about it. And the cousins heard about it and they said to go. So I did all these shows close proximity to each other so that the, it had a whole week to spread Mm-hmm. literally the word by the way 25 years ago when something hit yeah that was the only thing that was <laughs> being hit yeah you understand what i'm saying yeah now 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 i couldn't do this now it's all about timing okay like, so i can't really mention suggest anything to a young fellow like yourself because <laughs> things have changed so <laughs> then i did the last i did two shows at the flynn theater it's a long story mm-hmm. i wanted to rent it and the, the artistic director person that works for the artistic director, well, you know, we'll rent you the stage is we can put 200 chairs on the stage because Flint Theater is you. And I said, no, no, I want the whole thing Flint Theater because I yeah. felt this thing, man. I felt yeah. this thing. Now I'm going to go into Burlington and the seven days is going to do an article pre and Burlington Free Service is going to do a pre article for me. I know I can feel it. I yeah. can feel it. It's, it all happened. So, mm-hmm. so the, they said, well, we can rent you to the theater, the Flint Theater, and we'll only sell 700 seats to you. I said, no, I want the whole Flint Theater. Yeah. Long story short. It was going to be in October at the end of my tour. The yeah. only dates they had open, they didn't have any weekends. So I took a Monday and a Tuesday. I shit you not, the end of this whole tour, the, the weekend before was in Middlebury. And there's people lined around Middlebury yeah. High School. I mean, there's 600 yeah. people. They're sitting on the roof. You know, two nights I did. And then I went Monday and Tuesday at Flint Theater. There's a thousand people in there each night. So it just, yeah. it, it just took, it just, it was a snowball. It could happen back then yeah. in Vermont. Why did the Flynn Theater not give you the? I mean, did, were they living under a rock and did not know that every every venue that you have touched was self was turning people away? Why would they not give you were a well, thing? You were a thing. Good question. And yeah, I'll, and I'll tell you the answer. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> they were living under a rock. <laughs> okay. Number one. Number two. I'm just this guy renting people's like in Morrisville. Okay. I'm just this guy renting Montpelier High School, and there's okay. 800 people there. Mm-hmm. These people, I will say, I will mm-hmm. say that you don't hear much, you don't hear anything bad out of my mouth because I'm not a bad guy. Yeah, and you can't defend me. One could say, yeah. people who are in charge of running theaters, I'm not talking mm-hmm. about comedy clubs. That's a whole yeah. other freaking mess. <laughs> They're running theaters. They yeah. have invest. They have uh, angels that give them money. Okay. They have programs. So they mm-hmm. have a type of show that they present. Yeah. Uh, so and so theater presents a lot of ballet and they do opera and they do this. Mm-hmm. You know, they don't have uh, Louis C.K. coming. You know what I mean? Yeah. They don't have. So, so I wasn't on their radar exactly. because I wasn't the type of thing that the board of the yeah. Flint. Wanted. Yeah. I'm going up there and I'm going, you sons of bitch and pecker heads. <laughs> you know, Jesus H. Christ, Jenny, <laughs> I'm rowing. They didn't, like you, take time mm. to go, oh, oh, I get this guy. Yeah, we'll, we'll, not only 
not only do we have a weekend for you, we want to present you. So here's, here's a final of that story. Yeah. So I rented the place. Yeah. I rented the Flint Theater. It's a union hall. Yeah. I'm a 37-year-old guy. Yeah, you making tons of money because people yeah. are flocking. This is before the video. Yeah. Flocking to this thing. I do 2,000 people probably charging 15 bucks a, a head at that point. Mm -hmm. So that's what? That's 20,000 and another five times two is what? 1,000. So that's $30,000. Mm -hmm. right? So I had advertising expense, but I yeah. just paid Don the fiddle player. Yeah. So I go because they, they sold the tickets, you know, went, the tickets went through them. So I go to pick up my check. They get the $30,000 of tickets. And then yeah. they take their rent from that. Okay. And they give me the check okay. for 18000 Yeah. And I go in there and that same woman that rented it to me for Monday and Tuesday said to me, oh boy, it did really well, didn't it? I said, yeah, it, was, yeah, it really did. <laughs> and, she's, and she's writing out the check and she says, Arnie, the guy that was in charge of it. Yeah. She said, you know, Arnie wanted me to ask you. He said he wants to produce you next time. <laughs> Have you and been I back said, to the Flint that? Theater? Have you been back to the Flint Theater? Or have you been? I didn't, them? I've never done shows there in my okay. whole lodger show. I've, I've done okay. other things there. I've played okay. with Grace Potter. But I said, no, no, that's, that's all right. Because um, I yeah, wasn't you're on going fine on your own. To, yeah. Was that? I thought you were fine on your own. You didn't need someone to get out of your money. Not yeah. only that, but, yeah. but playing the Flint Theater for me was kind of a novelty. Mm -hmm. I actually, I actually had a party on stage after the first night with cheese. It <laughs> yeah. was a novelty, and let me tell you, mm -hmm. this is why I've always produced myself in little high schools and everything, because mm -hmm. that was twenty five years ago. In the Flynn Theater, cost twelve, mm -hmm. six thousand dollars a night. Mm -hmm. What do you think it costs a night now? So <laughs> I'm making yeah. eighteen thousand dollars in a night. Yeah, where I, yeah, but I made thirty. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I only yeah. got eighteen, so <laughs> yeah. I'm not gonna. So, so two thousand people. So I'm gonna go to each of these towns, and sooner yeah. or later, I'll get two thousand people. Yeah, but I'll get thirteen dollars out of the fifteen. Yeah, they, you know. So I'm not gonna do the Flint there. It's a waste yeah. of money. I mean, exactly. Yeah. Now, now, um, uh, so the, the snowballing effect of the logger was it to get on to get on shows, to present your material to people all around Vermont? Were you just calling up different venues and renting them? Or did you rely on word of mouth? Like so-and-so from this was like, hey, you got to check out this Rusty DeWeese guy. And they're like calling you up then. Or was it all just you renting it and then just just believing in yourself and faith and in, in, in your act and knowing that you're going to make money? Because All that. Okay. All that. That's awesome. I got That's so ballsy, tour. man. I got yeah. done the first tour. Mm -hmm. Ended up at the Flint Theater. I got another tour going. I wrote different, some new material, but I can't. Yeah. I said to myself, I am going to make give give each of the six hundred thousand people in this state an opportunity to see this because I bet I bet a lot of money that most of that those six hundred thousand people mm -hmm. would really enjoy this. Yeah. And then and then I I said, well, they, they might they might like a video. But what yeah. happened was. On the other, you're kind of on the right track there. Yeah. No, it was all me just saying, I'm just going to keep producing this myself. And then mm -hmm. I did a second video. But what happened was, as far as this, this thing's concerned, well, shit, man, I'm playing to 800 people yeah. on a Friday and Saturday night in a town yeah. that only has 1,600 people. <laughs> those 800, pe those 800 yeah. people are going home. Yeah. And they all have jobs. Yeah. And their jobs do summer parties mm -hmm. and their jobs and they sit on the, they're the, they're the bosses of this little yeah. company that makes so-and-so. So when it came mm -hmm. to be Christmas party time mm -hmm. or summer party time, you got to get this guy call, yeah. call. Well, how do we find him? Just go to his call. My name's in the goddamn book. <laughs> you know, it's always in the book. Yeah. My, my number is on Facebook. So, yeah. so it was like, it was like, lightning in a bottle and then yeah. schools the last thing i thought was that schools were going to call me well what happened is all these uh, little mostly boys in these mm -hmm. high schools were like you mm -hmm. were looking at the video mm -hmm. they're freaking the frig out <laughs> and the teachers were like and the teachers were like holy shit then i let it out and it, i was smart with the press because the press was, was all over it. so mm -hmm. i let it out in the press that i worked at a fancy auction house and then yeah. I was doing big movies and everything. Yeah. And that I didn't drink. This, yeah. this is cider. That I didn't <laughs> drink. Yeah. 
So then the high schools are like, the English teacher would go, well, so you, so Johnny and Stevie, you got D's in my class. Yeah. Who's this guy you like? Oh, he's a logger. He's really funny. Hmm. And then they'd see the article. Well, this guy ain't nobody's fool. Yeah. <laughs> he's working in New York city. Yeah. He doesn't drink. He's a good, he's a good, uh, mm-hmm. you know, what do you call for, for kids? Plus he wrote all this stuff and mm-hmm. he's been in movies with, you know, Brad Pitt and going, hold the <laughs> shit. Now they started calling me yeah. <laughs> to talk to the English class to get yeah. these two logging kids that like to log mm-hmm. interested because look what Rusty did. Yeah. All Rusty was, was a guy that wanted to drive a truck when he was 12. Yeah. And not yeah. that you guys are going to turn out to be comedians, mm-hmm. but so, I mean, it was fucking schools and then yeah. it was companies h- hiring me to do their ads. Yeah. That's awesome. Uh, yeah. I saw a few of them. Yeah. I saw a few of your, your uh, now, um, uh, what was I going to say? So now, so I, I've always wanted to ask you this question. I'm going to go on a limb here and ask this. You, you're now at this point now you are a Vermont celebrity, but everything I read about you, everything I hear about you, you know, and all my research is like, you're this good guy. Like you're even during COVID, you're feeding the homeless. Like you're taking care of your father. Like you do all this. You're a celebrity. Was there a rock and roll lifestyle in Vermont? I mean, I, you know, people have stereotype Vermonters, you know, people, you know, you know, oh, they're, you know, they're, they're wood folk or whatever. Like, was there a celebrity part? Was there a rock and roll element to the logger? Like after the show where there, was there a celebrity lifestyle now that you lived or was it always, Rusty just went back to his house, printed out posters, and drove 60 miles to the next place and hung them up. Which, was there any celebrity to this? Well, there's a lot of answers. There's a lot of questions there. First of yeah. all, I, I don't, I, uh, I'm ver- fairly positive that everybody is, is pretty much nice and feeding their father and <laughs> doing like meals on wheels too. I wouldn't say everybody. <laughs> yeah. to, to ask, to answer the question, yes. Okay. And it, and it exists today. I remember been doing a logger for a year or two and I mm-hmm. went to this fair, local fair. Mm-hmm. It's in Tunbridge. Mm-hmm. It's very much a country fair. Yeah. And all those people had, that's just probably after the video. So it's three, two or three years. I don't know. Mm-hmm. And two of my buddies went with me mm-hmm. and we're walking the, the midway and there's yeah. a lot of people, there, a lot of people. Yeah. And they're all, Hey Russ. Hey, Hey logger. Hey, yeah. hey, hey logger. And my friends, we got in the car and my friends were like, Jesus Christ. These, everybody knows you. I was like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So, so yeah, I mean, I went to do posters today and now it's to the point I'm 61 years old. Now it's to the point that I've been around so much that it really is kind of like, Oh, Hey, I thought that was you. And, and you know, people, <laughs> but it's basically like, they know me okay. before we were talking about. Yeah. Before it was like, Holy crap. We just yeah. saw him with Patrick Swayze. And we, I mean, there's people like you're an older guy when you got this video, but people watched it at, every Christmas with their families yeah. when they're eight, nine, 10 years old, and their grandfather liked it. And then their grandfather would die. And when that 10 year old girl, when she's 18 would see me mm-hmm. on the street, yeah, she, it, she would be moved yeah. because her grandfather, here I am. Yeah. It's, it's a real celebrity thing. Yeah. So well, the I was, say, like, question, the, was there, were there lottery groupies? Were there, did you get deal? Like the people be like, Hey, here, have a, you know, you have this, you know, you, you, you ate for free. Were there, were there like the women, the drugs, the alcohol with this? I mean, maybe you didn't partake in it, but was it around you? Because maybe people wouldn't think that it was because you're not like this, you know, Sam Kinison guy. But did that exist in the logger back then? This kind yeah. of like groupy lifestyle that existed or whatever? Or the, the- First of all, I don't drink. So okay. that was an apparent thing. Yeah. So I, when you don't drink, you're yeah. not a- around a drinking area yeah uh, do drugs obviously but mm-hmm. yeah um you could say i could say if you want to go there i it's could not, say as far as that's all as far as with um with the opportunities yeah. as yeah it's it's a it's a celebrity and nice. those, those opportunities they exist today okay. and, and partly partly they exist because i'm I, i'm i'm attainable i'm yeah. out there it yeah. would exist for any guy or girl if you're out there. So uh-huh. I was never like, hey, I'm kind of cool. Yeah. I, I'm always like, the reason I have these opportunities yeah. is because I'm on three DVDs. Yeah. You know, yeah. I'm nobody's prize. But, but so, yeah, oh, yeah, that, that was definitely there. And I did not part. 
I was mentoring a kid and he was, he yeah. was, from, from he was like about 12 mm -hmm. and he was with me during the height of it. And he, he wasn't a kid that had a tough uh, parent thing. He was a kid. I was mentoring him a professional mentorship. You want to be an actor or yeah. friends to this day. He's like 36. Mm -hmm. And this was happening. And there was, there was opportunities with women. A lot of them, come, you know, all over them. And he, and I never, and I didn't take them. Oh, wow. Yeah. Because, well, wait, because yeah. early on, because I wanted to protect the brand. Okay. You can't go around do, I chose not to go around doing that because first of all, people are saying you're doing it anyway, but okay. if you're literally not, yeah. then a woman can't go home to her boyfriend and say, you know what happened tonight? <laughs> that longer guy saw me in a bar and he made a pass at me. Meanwhile, I didn't do a goddamn thing. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. so you can keep yourself safe if you're not going around, around any of that. Yeah. And, um, and if I was being very open to that lifestyle, mm -hmm. again, call back. That's a mm -hmm. word in your profession. Yeah. I'm in a state of 600,000 people. I'm yeah. going into every town. Yeah. I'm going into their high. I'm doing, I, I, I've, I used to do two and three graduation speeches a year. I just did one last year. Do you think the hell I'd be doing graduation speeches if I was making a play for every woman <laughs> at every little ice cream shop I went into? You will run across people who will say, oh, that guy's just a whore dog. It's not true. It's just, it's just not true okay. because I would not be here yeah. in this state yeah. if I was going around to, however, Mm -hmm. Very in a very protective way. Yeah, I was able to, um, and I'm not saying take advantage of opportunities. I'm mm -hmm. saying I was able to, um, you know, go, uh, engage in mm -hmm. the the ease at which opportunities arose okay. and do arise. Uh, yeah. I was able to do that at a certain time in my life. More and oh, so this kid once said to me, he was 15. <laughs> he said, "Man, you got to start." I was like four in my 40s. You gotta start taking advantage of some of this because you're, you're gonna you're gonna turn it out and and, and, I, and I did and I and I didn't take advantage of it but I yeah. I opened myself up to yeah the small risk mm -hmm. risks that yeah. came along with that and if you're smart and you're not going out with married women and you're not yeah. drinking you're yeah. not um I'm I, uh, by the way I was never a boss to anyone any yeah. woman that ever worked at me at my merch table yeah any woman that was ever in my calendar yeah. I never, I swear to God, I don't know why. Yeah. My friends look at me and they go, what the, you didn't, I said, like, no, I never touched them while they were working. So it was, no, it was none of that, you know, it was okay. none of that, but, but could, could, could anybody say man, woman, man, man, woman, woman, anybody say at this point in life, so-and-so did this yeah. and I didn't want it to happen. Yeah. Did anyone say that to, to anybody? Yeah. yeah. But they're not going to say, you know, it's just not going to happen to me. Cause that, that's a, that wasn't, I mean, I would almost have them sign an affidavit. Yeah. <laughs> you know what we were yeah. getting into here. Exactly. So, so anyway, yes, there was that. And, and, and be, beyond that, you know what, you know what is being, being well-known, being, I'm mm -hmm. well-known, I'm a public figure. Yeah. And what that does is it makes you, it makes it like you're a real handsome, uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, rich guy. Yeah. You have advantages. Yeah. You, you walk in and people go, that's all you're known. You're familiar to people immediately. Yeah. That's what celebrity is. Yeah. And being familiar to people, if you're kind of a good guy and in your heart, you're a good guy is a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. You know, no, from I, that people go, Hey, come on over. Yeah. You know? Now let's, let's take the opposite side of that during this time, you are you are performing all the time. You're constantly having to write new material. You're doing all your own marketing, all your own booking, yeah. all your own merchandising. Was there a point where you like you're just your mental psyche was just like I am exhausted. I cannot keep up with all this. Did you ever experience the downside of celebrity and performing? No, I was able to always schedule schedule it myself. So if I knew I was going to do a Christmas tour. Yeah. Then January and February, I would have company parties and everything, but yeah. it's not every night. It's not every night. I, the, the, the main part of the work is in the, is in the uh, administrative thing and the marketing and yeah. getting the call in the theaters. So I was able to, not, I would do 
I would do a couple of tours a year, but okay. then also the, the Christmas parties and company, parties. but those people called me. Okay. So it wasn't like that, but, but I, oh, I was focused and working. I'm in a single guy and that's mm -hmm. a choice, a life choice. It's yeah. not really a choice. It's just the way I am. Yeah. But I've recognized with a couple of women recently that I've been with, you know, mm -hmm. I was just really dialed in and focused, you know, Tom Brady quit football. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. He, he's the exception with because he is married has a lot of kids but yeah Derek Jeter didn't get married until he retired you know and exactly. had a kid right away so yeah. so I was just yeah I was I would come home because because I was raised in the theater and I wouldn't use sound I, mm -hmm. I rarely use sound anymore I just tried to do it the old fashioned I would mm -hmm. come home I couldn't talk my throat was bleeding yeah. but I oh, was wow I was intense I'm, I was in my 40s and I'm really that healthy now mm -hmm. but I just wouldn't want to do it there's mm -hmm. an inertia, a certain point of your life for certain things. And I had that inertia in spades. So yeah. no, I never just went, this is too goddamn much. I mean, yeah. cause, cause the opportunity was there. Yeah. You know, what if you all of a sudden Netflix is calling you and all this yeah. stuff. I mean, it's like you would be going, you would love, you know, so, so yeah. no, I never, I mean, I would get sick after a tour. Mm -hmm. The body goes, you know how it is, you know, yeah. your body goes. Oh, I, I, I don't know. I was never as busy as you. <laughs> no, but I mean, in yeah. life, oh, you, know, okay. you, you do something yeah. and all of a sudden your body drops out. Yeah. You know, sort mm -hmm. of at a, at a good time, good timing. Mm -hmm. And yeah. it would do that. And, uh, but here again, I was always healthy. I always mm -hmm. ate well. I, I, don't, I didn't, I wasn't coming home, you know, and stopping at the bar. I would, after a show, I wouldn't go out with a woman. Yeah, or even you know a guy that wanted hey boys boys want me to go out a lot of times. Yeah. come on, yeah. I wouldn't go. Yeah, I wouldn't freaking go, and that's <laughs> that's partly where I want to get the hell home, man. I rest. You know, you 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 are you are definitely a role model, Rusty. I, I you know it's it's you know you're you're it's you're a solid you're a solid guy, solid guy. Right. Which I which is what I thought of you. I was I, I was like wondering if that question about was there a darker side to this celebrity. I was like, if he comes up with something, I'll be completely. Flabbergasted. <laughs> nothing about your image that gives me that impression. So <laughs> there's no darker side. I will say yeah. there, there's some stuff. Like in other words, because mm -hmm. if I wasn't the guy that's well known, mm -hmm. I was able to have uh, times that I would have never had. And if if I'm if I'm around a bunch of guys, my peers, mm -hmm. telling telling them the opportunities I had, mm -hmm. yeah, they'd be going freaking nuts. <laughs> you know? That 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 exists. That exists. That yeah. existed. You know. Plus plus. I was always single. Yeah. I was never married. Yeah. So, so you know, if I was exactly. a 40 year old guy married the whole time, yeah. that, that type of thing would, I wouldn't have done that. So yeah. I was able to tap into that was a pun. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Now let's talk about your after show because there's a story you tell where you're on set with Billy Ray Cyrus and you see like during during a break, you're just hanging out and you're watching these fans flock to Billy Ray and they're asking to play Icky Breaky Heart and he doesn't. And you say, the story is, you said, from that moment on, I will shake every hand. I will be the, you know, I will take the, the that authenticity and that, you know, just people came to see me. So I want to give a little, little piece of me to the, you know, people. Tell me what happens after a show. After you walk off that stage, what do you do? the audience with your merch table with whatever you need to do tell me about the end of the show part and how crucial that is to building your following yeah well at the height of it at the height everybody has a height you know mm -hmm. there would be a line of 20 30 people after a show and you just stand there and, and my fiddle player i had mm -hmm. like these little protectors his mm -hmm. wife that was doing the tickets yeah you didn't i didn't need to be protected obviously but yeah. and you, you just you, I'm there, man. I'm mm -hmm. there. I'm at the listen. If sometimes just if somebody's coming and they come home from work, mm -hmm. then they like wash their hands in their sink, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and in their face, and they come yeah. to a show to see me. Um, it's like if I if I have an egg farm and you buy my eggs, mm -hmm. you want to you want to talk goddamn eggs <laughs> in, in the super in the supermarket <laughs> aisle. I will yeah. be talking eggs with you. Yeah. So so that's the that's the post show. Then about nine or 10 years ago, I'd been in it 15 years. I thought, I don't, you know, when Peaches and Don, the fiddle player and the Peaches yeah. got done doing tickets, I said, mm -hmm. I'm going to take the tickets. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, when you come with your 12 year old son who mm-hmm. likes me, mm-hmm. just because he saw me in Black Dog, mm-hmm. to see me, and you're going to pay now, it's, uh, I'm going to do $20 in these next shows this, this year. It's mm-hmm. been 25 at some point, sometimes 20. Mm-hmm. And you're going to pay $40 for two of you, the father and the son. Mm-hmm. The moment you walk in that goddamn place, mm-hmm. you're going to be looking at me. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. I'm going to be, hey, what's up? Yeah. Uh, did you reserve tickets or did you go on Eventbrite? <laughs> oh, we did. and that also breeds that the familiarity. I've been doing wow. that now for a decade. Yeah, and, you know it breaks down that barrier. I'm not in the back. I could, yeah. I could create this whole essence around me that I come out and then uh, see you later. You yeah. know, <laughs> yeah. I literally am there. I get there. I was at Barton today. I'm renting yeah. that theater. The town clerk woman showed me through. I got to bring a construction light because they don't have lights. And I asked her if there's. there's the, the stairs will be shoveled. She said, yeah, my son, he's a senior in high school. He's going to sh- shovel. I'll yeah. get there. Yeah. I, it's me. Yeah. I'll get there at five 30. Yeah. She'll have given me the key. Yeah. I'll bring my little green bag in my guitar. Cause I checked the sound. I, I don't need sound system here. Yeah. And I'll set up my table. I'll put my merch there and I'll sit there. Seven 30 show. I'll sit there about six 15. People will start coming in. And they'll come in and they'll talk to me. We saw you uh, do a graduation for yeah. our granddaughter. Oh yeah, when was that? Well, that was uh, late. That was uh, back in uh, 2014. It was at <laughs> it was at uh, Essex. I go. Oh, I remember that. Yeah. There was there was and, and then they'll go. Yeah, yeah, that was. It. I say, how's how's your granddaughter doing? Yeah. Well, she's good. She's she's down in Connecticut now. Well, what the fuck? That's what life is. Yeah. Th- that's what I call life. Yeah. yeah. So I've, I've, I'm, I'm selfish because I've yeah. created that for myself. So then yeah. they go and sit in there. Yeah. And then the next ones come and then it gets to be 725 because I yeah. don't have to do a pre-show thing anymore. Yeah. I'm prepared enough, mm-hmm. you know, the nights before. Mm-hmm. And then 725, I'll put a little sign there. It says, if you show up, mm-hmm. you can pay me after. Okay. Literally. Yeah. So I get up there and then during the show, I'll say, by the way, the, the four people that came in, where are you from? The, we <laughs> yeah. came down from Newport. Well, thanks for coming late. You know what I mean? But I'll say, <laughs> I'll, I'll say you, you can pay me after just come up to the thing. They'll go, oh no, we actually, we put uh, $80 uh, underneath your thing there. You'll say, okay, thanks a lot. Well, freaking the audience loves that shit. <laughs> so the, the point is, and it's not just after the show. Now it's before, during and after. Yeah. You're coming to see me. I am the product. You can smack me around if you really want to. I swear to God, if you pay me enough, I'll let you smack me. <laughs> wow. So, I mean, I'm just picturing you like you're 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 coming in, you're you're getting the stage already, you're taking tickets, you're going on stage, like you're dr- coming off stage like dripping in sweat, you're selling your merch and shaking hands, taking photos. You know, it's, I think there's a lot to learn from that lesson there. I think, you know, you really build, I think the thing right now with why social media is so popular is because it gives people who are fans of people a chance to connect with them. But what you're doing is you're connecting with them at the show in like face to face. So like how I'm connecting with you is through Facebook. When you do a Facebook live from your barn, I'm watching you, but I would connect, I would probably, you know, more willing to return and see more stuff if you're like taking pictures with me and signing my shirt and, and here I'll get, you know, my daughter graduated and you did the, you know, I can see where that bill. So, I mean, fantastic, fantastic advice there, Rusty. Thank you. For Thanks. That. Thanks. Um, I have to ask you with the first logger movie at the end when you were doing the interviews with the Vermonters again, I love that. I love, I, these people all seem to have somewhat connection with you. I think one was your boss. Um, what made you put that in there? And what did that, like, what did you think was going to come from that? And how did you get them on camera? Because none of those people looked like they were going to be like willing to sign up on dot line to be on DVDs distributed throughout the country kind of thing. So tell me where all all that came together. Well, at that point, the logger was known pretty well. And one of them was my boss. The other one was the Mm -hmm. farmer. I knew all them, all those gentlemen. Yeah. And they were very uh, benevolent kind mm-hmm. men yeah. in my life. Yeah. And they were very authentic, v- v- Vermont, authentic Vermont. And uh, yeah. I'm making an authentic Vermont piece 
And uh, I thought, I'm, I, I guess I'm 36 years old. I'm very aware. Mm-hmm. When I was in New York, before mm-hmm. I did that, and I was doing acting, I'd work out in a gym. First of all, I worked for this man called William Doyle, and he owned yep. William Doyle Galleries. I was his right-hand man. He had three mm-hmm. daughters in high school, took them to their fancy high schools. I, yeah. I drove them, and then I went to the, with the family to East Hampton. Yeah. I learned about business from this guy. Mm-hmm. Another thing I did when I would be working out in, in New York before I started the logger is I'd get on the treadmill thing or the Stairmaster and I would read those uh, magazines like People and mm-hmm. Us and all these, you know, with all the little Jessica Simpson in there. Mm-hmm. And I was studying that stuff. I was going, oh, the reason Brad Pitt's in this magazine now is because he's coming out with a movie. The movie's called Troy. I see mm-hmm. how that works. Mm-hmm. This magazine isn't interested in Brad Pitt. Yeah. Brad Pitt has people who are interested in getting him into that magazine. Yeah. So, um, so I was, uh, many reasons, I was, I always had a great sense of Mm -hmm. the business aspect of it. Yeah. Okay. Mostly creative to get that authenticism of that, Mm -hmm. that first video. The stories were authentic, Vermont. I looked like an authentic, and you know, I looked a must. Yeah. That, by the way, that sweating and that working hard, yeah, that is because I sweat and I work hard. But when I when I knew that when I found figured out that 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 was happening, yeah, I said to myself, "That's brilliant." Yeah, because these people coming to see me, yeah, work hard, yeah, and they like it mm-hmm. that I'm working hard. That's just another piece in the goddamn chain. Yeah. It worked for me. Yeah. So I was very aware that to get those guys in there was very authentic, but it was also a selling point. It broadens yeah. out your selling point. You know, did you ever have them come up to you afterwards and be like, complete strangers are coming up to us and saying, I've seen you in the locker room. Abs- absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> all, like, those I people, talk to these people. <laughs> all those people became very, very, uh, they had their yeah. little moment of fame. I mean, Dale Percy was my boss, mm-hmm. a skinny. Mm-hmm. You know, he he would go turkey hunting down in Addison County, and he yeah. I'd see him on the show. I went down to Addison County, and they was all kidding me about that video. Yeah. Why you did? Oh, they're happy as hell. And that guy Merle, you know the guy yep. you talked about that Uncle Fred. Yeah. I yeah. mean, him and his family were just so thrilled. They became and just the first story about Scotty, you know, little yeah. little yep. Scotty, Scotty yeah. and the boys. But Jesus Christ, those are guys I really worked with. The real yeah. names and everything. Yeah, guy. I mean, they were like <laughs> local, local, you know, a, little bit of, a little bit of fame, you know. That's awesome. And That's I was, so awesome. that was a, I get a kick out of that 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 happened. Yeah. And then, so, and then you come out with Logger Two, Logger Three, boom, 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 and then your act changes now to what what is present day, which is a music comedy act with a fiddler. Why the change? What was the conscious decision to no longer do? you know, like a one man show or one man live comedy act, why now incorporate music throughout it? I mean, I know you always had the fiddler. Why incorporate music throughout it now? What was the strategy there? Was it you're just bored with the old format? You want to do something like this? Right. I don't know how many times I did the the logger for years and years and years, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine years. And then I thought I was a, I'm a drummer and I was a good drummer. Mm-hmm. So I thought, yeah, I'm gonna play the drums. And now I can get a band together. I can talk to, I can call up some of my buddies who are really hot players and I can guarantee them an audience. Mm-hmm. So I put the band together and then I did a CD, just another yeah. way of yeah. marketing the thing. But mm-hmm. also I was having fun. Now I will say, um, of, I have 10 or 11 shows coming up. I'm mm-hmm. only bringing the fiddler on three. Okay. So, so mostly like the Spartan thing and mm-hmm. uh, that I, I was doing today. I'm going, by, when I say I'm going by myself, Yeah, there's no fiddle player. And I, the 725, I walk down there. There's no fiddle player there. I have the guitar. So yeah. so then when when Don got done, I, I bought a guitar when my dad went in a nursing home. I was 43, yes. he was 93. Mm-hmm. And I started mm-hmm. playing for him and I got pretty good at it. And then Don and I would, would I said, I'm going to play on stage. Again, the people seeing and hearing mm-hmm. a different thing. And mm-hmm. now, about three or four years ago, I kind of got really interested in it. So yeah. now I'm flat picking. And you're good. Now, you're hella good. <laughs> I, oh, thank you. Now <laughs> yeah. I can get up on, there on stage and I yeah. can flat pick and sing. It's fun for me. Yeah. I don't, the show isn't 80% me singing yeah. and 20% me telling jokes. It's 80% me being funny yeah. and 20% me, me playing. But um, 
you can't go wrong with music, you know? Yeah. Well, so that's we why ever, that is. That's why that is. Will we ever see a Logger 4? You, 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 it's been decades since the Logger 3 has come out. You've amassed so much material since then. Now you, hold, now you bring music into it. Will we ever see a Logger 4? I always thought that there would be, you know, three, four, five years after three. But then, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I'm 61. <laughs> the whole media thing has changed. Mm -hmm. I'm not interested. Not because it's not the right thing. I'm mm -hmm. not interested in getting, I have different content. Right? I'm not interested in putting that content and getting it and streaming it and selling it at, you know, three minutes for a dollar. <laughs> I'm not interested in doing that, man. Yeah. You know, I'm just not. You got three DVDs. By the way, the first two I sold as videos. You talk about money. Yeah. Yeah. The first two I sold as videos. Yeah. Talk about timing. Yeah. And then videos went out and I DVDs know. came in. And yes. I re I repackaged them and sold oh, wow. as many of those one and two DV videos. Yeah. As a, so I double sold the first two products. That's awesome. And then I did calendars. Yeah. The calendars sold shitloads. Why don't I do calendars anymore? People don't buy calendars. <laughs> they got fun. So yeah. so there won't be a logger for. There'll be me flat picking. There'll yeah. be me um, you know, just doing the tiny town hall tour mm -hmm. to 40 people in Craftsbury of a winter mm -hmm. night. Why 40 people? Because I only put three ads in one paper. Oh, okay. When I was doing Burlington, yeah, I, you know, okay. When I was doing Christmas shows, I would do like you'll like this. I would do like let's say six locations. Let's say mm -hmm. Bellows Falls, South Burlington High School, mm -hmm. uh, Stowe Christmas mm -hmm. Week, who you know somewhere else Montpelier. I'd do like five or six locations. I would do total, let's say, 14 to 16 to 12 shows. Mm -hmm. And it would cost me $60,000 to produce those. Oh, my gosh. Oh, yeah. People, I mean, nobody, know, nobody knows mm -hmm. that. You're renting yeah. the places. Yeah. Because this was in the, the heyday. People mm -hmm. would flock. I would, I would make mm -hmm. a lot of money. I, plus, I got sponsors. But yeah. the, the point is, um, if I'm going to do these shows and put all the work into it at South mm -hmm. Burlington high school. I'm going to do it five nights. You got to rent it, but you got to spend four grand just in the Burlington free press. Then yeah. you got to spend $3,500 in seven, at seven days. You yeah. got to be on three radio stations that are all $3,000 a piece. So that's four and four is eight and three, six, nine, nine. There's 17 grand right there. Oh my gosh. Just, that's just South Burlington. And yeah. that's only part of the marketing. Yeah. And posters. I said, so, you know, I had to, it was a hustling thing. Yeah. And again, it's me. I'm yeah. doing the ads. I'm putting the posters up. I'm placing the ads. I'm making the mm -hmm. copy. I'm directing the shoots when I have my, mm -hmm. I'm getting to the theater first. I'm setting up the table. I chose to do that because that would be a life for me. That yeah. for me would be a working life. Yeah. Otherwise it would be, I'm, I'm hiring you mm -hmm. to open for me. I'm mm -hmm. hiring some guy to try to market me. Mm -hmm. And everybody's getting the money. And guess mm -hmm. what? Nobody markets me. Yeah. Like, what am I going to do? Hire yeah. somebody to do posters today? Yeah. I spent four hours doing posters. Everybody I saw like knew me. Yeah. Everybody I saw likes me. Everybody I saw, a lot of them will come. If they don't come this time, they'll come next time. And 30% of them are talking about me right now. <laughs> yeah. There's, you know. Yeah. So, uh, hey, you know what? I got um, only 20% left on my battery. Okay. I'll, I'll be sure I wrap this up. Oh, my gosh. There are two hours old enough time to talk to you, Rusty. Um, but so how has your advertising now changed today? I know you said you still do posters. But now, are you still using newspapers or are now you advertising on Facebook and stuff like that, too? How do you advertise now? Well, funny enough, I, I do still yeah. use newspapers. Again, okay. strategically, mm -hmm. Tiny Town Hall Tour. Mm -hmm. The tiny towns in Vermont, mm -hmm. their newspapers are still kind of going. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And, and my demographic leans toward who? The older people. Okay. Who, if anyone is reading the newspaper still, mm -hmm. the older people. So there's mm -hmm. still value. Of course, what, today, mm -hmm. what am I doing? Yeah. When I go into the store. 
and mm-hmm. I see a 65 year old lady. And mm-hmm. you still read the Caledonia record? Yes, we do. You know, yeah. out of those three papers, which one do you read? Well, we like the Chronicle. So I'm doing my market research, which you can't uh, do if you're hiring somebody yeah, exactly. who went to school to learn that, who don't know shit. Yeah, you exactly. Know, um, so I do do newspapers and obviously the Facebook Live, mm-hmm. the Facebook, the Facebook Live and the Instagram and radio stations. I'm doing Bellows Falls mm-hmm. and the artistic director down there is a nice guy. And mm-hmm. he has a relationship with the local big, big radio station down there. He hooked mm-hmm. me up with him. They're giving me a deal. I'm going to get up on stage and talk about the mm-hmm. radio station. I'm going to put their banner there. You know, there's mm-hmm. all that we haven't talked about yet. We can do it. Yeah. We can do another interview, you know, <laughs> at any time yeah. to do. So, so, cause the business, you see how freaking excited yeah. I get about the business. Uh, yeah. Cause the, the business side of it is why people have heard my content. Yeah. yeah. I think because either you're in comedy clubs Hmm. night after night after night you know honing your material like jerry did like david spade did yeah all those guys norm mcdonald either mm-hmm. you do that and then mm-hmm. an agent sees you or saturday night live if you're young you're at it and you're, you're doing the, yeah. the step in not stepping wolf i forget that the groundlings, groundlings. either you do yeah. that or you're me in a little yeah. in a little state yeah and i say you know what these people are going to know me yeah and they're and, and I'm going to be a good guy because yeah. I am a good guy. And, and that is why now, my friend, yeah. they come to these shows. That's awesome. As they should. As they should. That's, now, that's, you know, it's, it's work. I, I, now, I, I will say I haven't seen you perform since the Logger 3, since I'm not in Vermont. Is the Logger today still, are you still coming up with these stories about characters or are you still in more jokes? What is your writing and joke telling like now? Is it very similar to Logger 1? Or not at all anymore. Good, good question. I want to. I want to write. I have one in my head. I want to write another one of those stories about the charactery ones. You know, yeah. it's called Stanley. The day Stanley lost it, <laughs> it's, it's it's called. But it's it's a bit all over the map. Yeah, because that's what I want it to be. It's yeah. a little bit talking about the ironies of the rich mm-hmm. Vermont now and the poor Vermont, which has kind of always been the through line, but it's a little bit different. Mm-hmm. And I do do. Usually each night I will do either the deer jacking okay. or, or the, the little and the dog one. Okay. Uh, I may do both because people ask for those, yeah. but like in Bradford Saturday night, I'll probably do the, the dog one because people do, you know, James Taylor, what are you going to do? If you like James Taylor, you want to yeah. hear him play that freaking, but I didn't okay. do that for years. Finally, a couple of my good buddies said, you know, you should, you should do those story, stories because people love them and they do. They yeah. always ask. So, so I will do that, but there's a lot of new stuff. There's a lot of, it's a, it's fun stuff for me, for me to do. There's some fun stuff. There's a stuff about, you know, if you one percenters. Yeah. And, and it's a little tricky. You yeah. haven't even gotten into asking me this yet about <laughs> the, you know, the, you with your material these <laughs> days, you know, cause I talk about the rich white people. Yeah. So when you're talking about rich white people, <laughs> If you want to, if you want to hang around, I like rich white people. I say I'm a rich yeah. white guy. To somebody, I say we're all rich to somebody. You know, and I go, I yeah. confuse it that way. I talk about Bernie, not in a bad way. But yeah. then I go, if you want, if you want to hang around rich white people, go skiing. You know, <laughs> so you've got to be careful. Mm-hmm. I have a, yeah. I, and then I have a bunch of. It's they're really good. They're bang bang yeah. bang jokes. But but you got to be careful because when you're saying if you want to go hang around rich white people, go skiing, then people who aren't rich and white, yeah, can say. Well, fuck you, asshole. <laughs> I'm not rich and white, and I ski. Yeah. But I shave it off. I do say, yeah. no, I know there's all types of people ski. Yeah. But believe me, I grew up in Stowe, Vermont. Yeah. I know that skiing is predominantly rich. rich yeah. Boom. And then I go into it, you know, rich, yeah. right? People. I went to the ski event, the Killington ski event, the World Cup ski event down in Killington four years ago, 18,000 rich white people. I was standing at the finish line, 18,000 rich white people. I was checking them out. I was thinking, man, if I was, if I was looking for gluten, I'd be screwed. Right now. <laughs> and it goes on and it goes on yeah. and on. So by the time, you know, any, anyway, so you can get yeah. into it heavily. But uh, so, yeah. so it's, it's, it's different, certainly, than the first show. That was yeah. a theater show. Yeah. Now it's not. If you're going to ask me as a, as a, as a, 
as a thing in the in the sphere and this in the clouds mm -hmm. it's not as strong you know if you're talking about medicine it's it's yeah. not a medicine that'll cure a, a, a worse ill the first one was a strong thing yeah uh, but this is a uh, lighter and more fun the people still get more than their their money's worth but i do want to write another one of those stories yeah you know. now you've been playing this logger character for so long now and i remember an interview one time you were talking it was like a radio show but there was a video component to it um i'll put the link in the show notes where you're talking about i want to write an autobiography one day um have you ever thought of stop like i want to do some shows where there is no logger let's just let's get rid of all the logger and i want to talk about rusty like here are some you know here's pain in my early life and i want to make these funny jokes now like do you ever i know you talk about like you know the gluten thing these are observations that you have as rusty and wheeze but do you think you'll ever talk about real rusty on stage in a comedic manner that's good that's a good question well i will say in this new the new round of what i'm out mm -hmm. there i do i am more myself there's pieces mm -hmm. of the show and that's tricky too because you you're trying to do the character yeah, and then there's medium character. Then there's me. Yeah. I I appreciate the audience because they hang in there with me. Yeah, it's really not. I really shouldn't be doing that. I should either come in, but that's who gives it. So yeah, but um, works. I could do. I mean, I do things about getting older. You know, the the the, the peeing thing and everything because I don't really have any trouble with it. But yeah. I, um, but as far as the pain and everything, I I do open up more personally about myself. Mm -hmm. I now tell stories that aren't written out and thought out and have no punchlines. Mm -hmm. They happen that there are funny bit pieces within mm -hmm. a four or five minute story. I might talk about a story about uh, something that happened to me three or four days ago that I know is interesting to people, you know, to hear. So that isn't like, you know, I know my dad, uh, my dad, you know, he and my mom used to have awful arguments and I'd stay up till three in the morning. Uh, as far as that goes, and that's not true, by the way, yeah. but um, as far as that goes, I'm not sure about that, but mm -hmm. certainly may come more in it the older I get, because I do mm -hmm. do material and play some music and I can literally just start talking to people nice. and just talk to them. Hey, so now where are you from? You know, I could say, well, do you know, well, I, I remember I used to come down to Bradford as a kid. Yeah. And, my dad, and I did. So I tell this whole story about my relationship with Bradford and people eat that shit up. <laughs> they, they do so it's, yeah. it's it's not it's not the tragic life and, and inside yeah. pains of rusty yeah. so much but yeah i am opening up and just being myself yeah that's good awesome awesome um is do you write on stage and by that do i mean like do you go on stage with maybe like a seed of an idea and then just start like improvising on the spot and trying to find the funny on stage in a real audience or is everything well rehearsed prior to you giving it out to an audience uh, a, 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 a little bit of that i'll go on stage with mm -hmm. two or three line a two or three line joke mm -hmm. that can be the beginning of something bigger mm -hmm. so but that two or three lines that i'm going to do that night i may mm -hmm. not do them but i know them real well and i could bring them in that two or three lines i pretty much have down okay all right. Cool. So, so, but I'll go, Oh boy, that worked. That was just a seed yeah. of an idea and it was about whatever. And oh, okay. I can build on that. Okay, cool. Now the other things that you've done, I mean, you've done um, that I love is it's probably the shortest thing you've done. It's five minutes long. It's um, I, I, I think it's an ad for you, but it's sponsored by the alchemist. It's called hard work and it's your life. And it, it's a day in the life oh, yeah. of Russ. And it's, I've watched that thing like a million times because, well, I love the part where we I actually get to watch you in the moment come up with material on your iPhone. Oh, but, right, right, right. Yeah. But it's 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 like it's like a, such a romanticized version of like this life that I like. I mean, like it shows you working on your posters and then like, hey, I need my buddy to come and you got and it shows you guys working out your songs, and then it like you're getting ready, you, you go log, which you know, I don't know if that's something you actually do or just did it for that for that ad, but yeah, then, it is. It is. Yeah. yeah. Then you run up like a mountain. I <laughs> see like you're running, running up like a steep mountain. And then you come down and you start working out, which is that's, I would love that. I would love to watch any comedian in the moment come material. That's why I love that. You're coming up with material on your phone during it. And then it ends with you in the famous Rusty DeLeaf barn 
having a cigar at the end of the day. It's it's, it's fantastic. It's absolutely fantastic. I could, I'll Thanks. put a link to that in here as well. But um, I just want to say how much I appreciate that as well. But Rusty, this has been this has been surreal. I don't know. Thank you, a million thank yous. I never thought you would write back to me. So this is incredible. Um, no. I'm a huge fan. Um, and I appreciate your time and your energy and, and coming to the table, being open and honest about everything. Well, my pleasure. It's yeah. great. You were very, very thorough and very prepared. And um, yeah, good luck to you. And uh, thank you. You you have, you know, everybody has what it takes. It's, yeah. it's just, it's just life, life. You have to get life out of there and just yeah. do that thing. You know, yeah. it, it's, it's, it's difficult. It's work, but yeah, thanks for the time. And I oh. hope, uh, yeah, keep, I, keep doing what you're doing. Thank you so much. I'm indebted to you. I appreciate your time. Have a, have a good, good luck with your tour. And I'll let you know when this comes out. There's a little bit of editing I do to kind of smooth yeah. out the bumps. But That'd I'll be great. You, yeah, I'll, I'll email you and let you know when your episodes are going to hit so that you know. Thank you. Thanks. All right, buddy. Take care. Peace, I'll man. see you. Thank bye. you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.